Mr. Ravi, and it's really a terrific pleasure and honor to introduce Jaimini Bhagwati. Uh, he's really one of those polymath kind of guys. Uh, he's, he was a brilliant foreign service officer. He served as ambassador to Brussels and to High Commissioner to UK, but he's also uh, a PhD in economics and finance, and he's worked in the finance ministry. Now, if you don't understand bureaucracy, you understand it's very difficult for someone to work both in the finance ministry and the external affairs ministry because they're on opposite sides of, you know, Regina Hill. But uh, he's someone who's worked both in North Block and South Block, and that's exceptional. I mean, politi politicians do that all the time. You have ministers going back and forth, but in the bureaucracy, it's very, very unusual. And uh, he's uh, he's had a stellar career. He, uh, as uh, Ravi mentioned, he did his education at Stephens, then did a master's in Sloan in finance, then did a PhD in econom uh, finance or economics? Finance. finance in Tufts. Now, doing a master's in Sloan is difficult. Doing a PhD at Tufts is also difficult. But doing them at the same time is the extraordinary thing that he did. So you can see the kind of uh, person he is. And uh, I know him for a long time. He has a very strong Bangalore connection. His wife, Rita, is Nina Chandavakar's sister. I think that's probably when I first met you, or maybe I met you in Delhi, maybe at your place. And uh, he has been very hospitable to me. I went, when he was High Commissioner in UK, he had a wonderful dinner for me, and so on. So lots of things. But it's wonderful that he's here. It's wonderful that his, his book is being launched here. And uh, uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, request Jaimini to come up and speak. And then he and I will engage for some time in questions, which I have lots of them from his book. And then we'll throw it open. So Jaimini, please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Nandan and Ravi, for setting up today's discussion. I would also like to thank my sister-in-law, Nina, and her husband, Prem, for their support and encouragement. I'm going to read out my remarks here, and then uh, after that, I will say a few other things which have come to my mind and which I thought I'll share with you. Uh, the reason I put it down over here is because I think I'll take less time if I read it out rather than speak extempore. Well, to begin with, my book examines Indian foreign policy and national economy-related decisions, both foreign policy and economic policy decisions, and the context in which these decisions were taken at the prime minister's level over 72 years from 1947 till end May 2019. My book concludes with the election results at the end of May 2019. So that's an enormous span of time. And you might say, well, you know, this book will be all generalities because after all, there's no way that one, one book can encompass so much. I would tend to agree with you, except that every now and then I drill down to some details based either on my personal experience or based on my readings. As you can imagine, uh, 1947, I wasn't born, so I can't talk about personal experiences at that time. But yes, so that is more based on research. And you might wonder, why do we want to go so far back in time? Well, we're all familiar with the recent changes in the status of Jammu and Kashmir. I think uh, just that one uh, event and the related parliamentary approvals amply demonstrate that we do need to look very, very closely to events of the past to understand what are current developments. Taking a step, step back, for me, as I look back into the past, it is very painful to watch the cynicism that often pervades campaigning during Indian elections and subsequent government formation, particularly if no party gets a clear majority. I think I don't need to tell this group. Everyone here would remember the happenings before the recent change of the state government in Karnataka. And the ways, if you go back, in which the central governments of Charan Singh and Chandrasekhar and Deva Gauda and I.K. Gujral were formed and fell. I'm referring to some relatively short-lived coalition governments, which were marked by a lot of cynicism in the way the numbers were put together for parliamentary majority. Although this is an often repeated 
cliche. We have to somehow retain our optimism. And uh, I, for one, repose by faith on average persons of this country. Not entirely sure how many people in this room, in this auditorium, will qualify to be, but I leave it to you to decide, to be just average persons of this country who have again and yet again delivered India from the personal interest-driven actions of those in positions of authority. And usually they have done it through the ballot box. This book is written in English, and I'm hoping that at some stage I can get it translated into regional languages. Depends on if I can find publishers to do that. What, about 8 to 10 percent of the people in India are fluent in this language that I'm using right now? So therefore, my book is accessible to a very low percentage of Indians. Unfortunately, the knowledge of English has set a certain section of the elite in affluent urban India apart from what is nowadays called vernacular-speaking Bharat. These two groups, the English-speaking and those who speak in the vernacular, instead of pointing fingers at each other, that is, would do well to adopt each other's better qualities. I think the English-speaking need to learn and to be able to write, even more important than just read, at least one Indian language and be more mindful of the needs of the socially and economically disadvantaged sections of the population, that is. And those elements among vernacular Bharat who exult about an idealized, very possibly mythical golden past about ancient India, need to stop engaging in what I would call inverse snobbery. Looking at the examples of countries around the world and how they have developed or failed to develop, I think of Argentina, which I think is a representative example, far away from us in Latin America, a representative example of a country with a lot of promise at the beginning of the 20th century. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it has not achieved anywhere near what it could have in the last 100 years. India, with its large and vast markets, and as these markets increasingly get integrated, for example, due to the implementation of GST, although uh, some of that implementation has been faulty, but I think over a period of time it should yield results, all that augurs well for our future. But I would like to posit that we need to be wary of assuming that the rise of India over the next 10, 20, 30 years is somehow inevitable. It will happen because we have large markets, we have bright people, and it has to happen. That's why I gave the example of Argentina. Everyone felt that about Argentina 100 years ago, and it's still struggling, as you know, right now, again, once again, with an economic crisis. Now I come to why did I write this book? I could have just taken it easy after leaving government. I was a professor at a think tank for the last five years. Also particularly because there are so many books out there in the form of biographies, detailed studies by historians on post-independent India, and historians by definition far better equipped than me to talk about India's history. However, to the best of my knowledge, there are very few books that speak about the causalities of PM level decisions and the subsequent consequence, consequence says, with sufficient frankness. Those who have served in government claim that they made it a point to speak truth to power. I'm not sure that they did while they were in office or even later after they were out of office, either because they were very mindful of the sensitivities of their party bosses. Or if you were a civil servant, you're very mindful of the fact that if you need a post-retirement job somewhere, you need to be very careful about 
political bosses. So I would say that there are just too many examples of those who have chosen to, I'm going to use harsh language here, who have chosen to prostrate themselves in front of a feudal and entitlement infected political culture. And this is often done in the name of humility and self-effacement. Uh, by the way, uh, whatever assertion I make in this book, every number and factoid has been cross-referenced and cited in the notes which are listed by number and chapter at the end of the book. Well, personally, I would have preferred the footnotes along with the text for ease of reference. But Penguin felt that, you know, most readers prefer not to be distracted by footnotes. And uh, so I bowed to their point of view, and those footnotes are actually notes, uh, but under each chapter and by number. I'd like to thank my wife, Rita, who's here in the first row, without whose support and encouragement, this book just would not have been possible. She read every line and made suggestions on both content and idiom. Some time back, a couple of years back, we were driving back from a hill station called Mukteshwar in Uttaranchal. We were driving back to Delhi. And arguing about how best to compare decision making across time. Since context and constraints were so very different for our various prime ministers. For example, how could I compare the Nehru years with those of, say, Indira Gandhi, Narasimha Rao, or Vajpayee? Rita suggested that personal traits could be used to compare leadership qualities across time. And after some discussion between us, we settled on three defining attributes, namely character, competence, and charisma. In the book, they're called the three Cs. I have a few lines in the prologue about how I'm using or how I've used the three C's in the chapters. By the way, the three C's are not, and I would like to emphasize not in capital N, capital O, and capital T, intended to rank PMs. This is not a book which we are saying, you know, PM X was number one and someone else was number two and so on. These, are, these three Cs are meant to provide pointers to whether our prime ministers raised optimism or pessimism levels among the masses. And I'll explain in a minute as to why these two words optimism and pessimism, two sides of the same coin, are very important when it comes to administration and to development. After nearly 43 years of working in the government of India, the World Bank, and a think tank, I've come to the conclusion that development efforts, and we are a developing country, you could rank yourself wherever you want, but by and large, we are a developing country. There are certain aspects, particularly in Bangalore, which are at the forefront and the cutting edge of technology and so on, but when you take the whole country, it's a developing country and we need to develop. So our development efforts, I think, need a combination of about 80% heart and only 20% head. That means you need 80% driven by emotion and only 20% driven by technical solutions. And you'll say, how oh, have you come up with these wonderful numbers of 80 and 20 that is uh, divisible by 10 and so on. So therefore, likely to be wrong. Now, this is just based, again, on heart. I've come to this conclusion from my heart, not from my head. I think political leadership needs to coax and cajole those at the lowest levels of administration, whether it is with regard to security, basic security, without which nothing is possible, whether it is uh, primary education or basic health. 
how do you make people at the lowest levels of administration take their work seriously and do their work honestly? That means they put in their nine to five honestly. Nobody is asking people at that level of administration put in huge amounts of overtime. And unless they work honestly and diligently, you won't get the job of either security or primary education or basic health delivered to people. You can have numbers, you can have various statistics and Pratham does it for primary education and so on. But I feel that irrespective of what technical solutions you come up with, unless you can also get people enthused about actually implementing the multiple government programs, you can't really get, I think, a number of the people who are engaged in subsistent, subsistence agriculture off the land. I feel that we have far too many people on the land. This is not to say that they don't have a right to engage in farming. You can't move them up the education and the income ladder unless we reduce the number of people who are dependent on agriculture. And therefore, this, there is this recurring theme in the book of the extent to which optimism and cynicism has waxed or waned during the terms of our prime ministers. And most importantly, why? It's not enough to say that it went up or went down, but why did it go up or why did it go down? I will read out a few lines from a couple of chapters for the years that cover Jawaharlal Nehru, Narasimha Rao, and Atal Bihari Bajpai. I mean, this is random, this choice. There are many other prime ministers, but, uh, well, first Nehru. To begin with, uh, an extremely distressing error that some commentators make, perhaps unconsciously or perhaps deliberately, when they speak of Nehru and Indira Gandhi in the same breath as the Nehru-Gandhi dynasty. For me, the only way that Nehru and Indira Gandhi were related was that he was a loving father and she a doting daughter. In everything to do with modes of governance, building of institutions, transparency and personal values, they were as different as day and night. And I leave it to you to decide who represented day and light and who represented night and darkness. Many mistakes were made during Nehru's years, particularly in foreign policy. I'm not reading out from the book now. And uh, contrary to what people feel, and the book explains, his economic policies were rooted in what was the prevailing wisdom of that time, and that includes the foremost economists of that time, whether it is Raul Prevesh of Argentina, and so many others who visited India so frequently in those early years after independence. In fact, I would go so far as to say that without Nehru at the helm as prime minister after independence, there may still have been today a continuing, within inverted commas, idea of India. But I'm not sure that we would have had a undivided nation state called India today without him as prime minister to begin with. And I would like you to reflect, pause, and think, because there's so much that comes out in our media nowadays. I won't get into the details now. We can do it during question-answer session. We should remember why Gandhi chose Nehru to lead independent India. If you just look into those reasons, you will perhaps agree that without him at the helm, we would have not had a country which has had the same constitution since independence. If you look at towards the east or towards the west, country after country which became independent, either their constitutions changed or the leadership shifted from democracy to army dictatorship to break up of the country and so on and so forth. As far as economic policies are concerned post-independence, by the mid 
1930s. The book doesn't get into any details before 47. Uh, makes a few stray references. The Congress saw a softer version of socialism as the only way forward post-independence. There were a couple of reasons for that. One is that it is a very poor country, even much poorer than what it is today. And one reason was that while there were people at the elite level who ca came from very affluent families, like Nehru himself, and many who uh, were able to afford to go to England to take the ICS exam, the bulk of the people who were part of the freedom struggle were from the poorer classes. And the use of the word socialism and talk about their future was important. And I think a number of leaders of independent India were intellectually convinced that some amount of what they felt were the good points of socialism and today, people might say there are no good points about socialism. Socialism is evil. Socialism is to be decried. So therefore, I have just two photographs in the entire book. One is a photograph of an advertisement in Lahore, which uses the word Swadeshi to exhort people to buy something Indian. So, you know, this whole thing of import substitution, which happened post-independence, actually started pre-independence. And we are all familiar either because our grandparents told us or our parents told us about how during the freedom struggle, bonfires were lit in public places of British-made clothes. So, it's not a great wonder that there was an emphasis on the promotion of the production of domestic uh, goods were to be produced domestically after 1947. And as far as ownership of property was concerned, there are any number of letters. Nehru used to write letters to chief ministers every 15 days. A Couple of times uh, he missed that self-imposed deadline of a letter to all chief ministers who incidentally were mostly all Congress chief ministers. He made it clear that government should not own all modes of production, contrary to what some people say about him. Since we are talking about the performance of the Indian economy, I think one needs to refer to Narasimha Rao, and he really deserves the nation's gratitude for steering the economy out of trouble in 91. I, a lot of uh, books have been written about that period, but I think one needs to uh, focus on the fact of how difficult it must have been with a minority coalition government, with people within his party breathing down his neck and wanting to replace him. I think uh, he showed tremendous perspicacity and tenacity to set in motion an irreversible reform process, which has held India in good stead since then and led it to a sustained higher economic growth platform. Oh, by the way, I mean, we can't blame him for not having achieved more on the economic side because as recently as 1991, India's per capita income, as measured by the International Monetary Fund, you may agree or disagree with them, a reasonably neutral observer of per capita income and calculators of that number, India's per capita income, in US, as measured in nominal US dollars of that time, was $30 more than that of China, as recently as 1991. So anyway, I feel those same reforms could have been initiated by Indira Gandhi in, in 1971. Why? Because there were enough people talking about unshackling the Indian economy even then. But instead of doing that, she imposed multiple controls, including tighter industrial licensing, import substitution, and draconian foreign exchange controls. On the political front, unfortunately, she encouraged personal loyalty and feudal tendencies. I would go so far as to say that uh, independent India's history can be divided into pre-Indira Gandhi and post-Indira Gandhi. Pre-Indira Gandhi, more optimistic 
and higher levels of optimism and growing levels of cynicism post Indira Gandhi. Except, I have to add, that creation of Bangladesh, major foreign policy success, and you have to give most of the credit to Indira Gandhi. And that's like capital she built in foreign policy, which is paying dividends, I'm using a finance analogy, paying dividends till now. But on the feudalism front, many other parties, I don't have to name them, whether it is Mulayam Singh's party and his family, or whether it is Lalu Yadav and so on and so forth, they all copied her way of functioning, which is to promote children and other close relatives to high positions of power. As for Vajpayee, another prime minister who was very bold, he went ahead even in his short-lived government, the first installment of the Vajpayee six years, the one-year government, or less, I think. He went ahead with the nuclear tests in May 1998. I mean, there are people here, I'm sure, who feel that India should never have gone overtly nuclear. I would like to submit in this imperfect world, India had no option. And uh, I have to give him full marks on the foreign policy front for having engaged so shrewdly with the US to bring relations gradually back to normal. I think Manmohan Singh's ability to go ahead with the one, two, three agreement were embedded in all the work done by Jaswan Singh with Strobe Talbot, which has been explained and analyzed in my book. Others have done it, but I'm just mentioning how that all came about. Another success, less talked about, is that while he was patching up with the US, he was under tremendous pressure to send Indian troops to Iraq by George Bush Jr. But he was able to maintain the relationship with the US and yet not send troops to Iraq, which would have been a disaster in so many ways, and we can discuss that in the question and in the Q&A part of today's discussion. Now, coming to the present, I've been talking about the we now have Modi as Prime Minister, and this is his second innings. So let's talk first about where well, the book is only till end of May. We, what has happened after May is not in the book, so I won't talk about that. I think a number of valuable initiatives have been taken during 2014 and 19. I mean, we are all familiar, but just for the purpose of listing a few, Swachh Bharat, Jandhan accounts, which makes use of Nandan's, what I would think is one of the most important con contributions, Aadhaar, without that, Jandhan accounts and so many other aspects of today's India would not have been possible. Ujwala gas, gas connections for people of weaker economic background. And now, the, now in the sense that it came almost at the end of Modi 1, that is 2014 to May 2019, Ayushman Health Scheme. I don't know where it's all headed. Very frankly, I don't know where any of these are headed because we have to give it time for these programs to really roll out and become visible to us as whether they are really successful and to what extent and so on. But these are important initiatives in the area of public health, in the area of providing an easier means for, by which women of weaker economic background can do their cooking, and finally, and the other aspect, Jandhan accounts and so on, is financial inclusion. Uh, very recently, the government has reduced corporate tax rates, but that's not part of the book. But one uh, thing missing for me as somebody, as I said, who has been observing what has been happening in India for a very long time, either from within the government or outside now, there seems to be no overall construct in Modi's policies. He is very dynamic. He has these one-off initiatives. But I don't see an overall construct, whether it is to boost exports or to raise real GDP growth rates on a sustainable basis 
which is the only way, and don't believe me, go and look at writings around the world. The only way, the one and the only way, it sounds horrible for those who believe that social inclusion help, uh, and as we were discussing in the car with my co-brother-in-law, I'm told in South India, we are called cobras, <laughs> that uh, he mentioned somebody's name who has written a very uh, well-known book, I was unfortunately not aware of it, which says, Cast, the title is Caste is Important, and now he's teaching, I think, at Kennedy School and Harvard University. Yeah, so people will not agree, and I would agree with them. Along with pushing for higher GDP growth rates, you need to do a, there are a slew of uh, actions that both the central government and state governments have to uh, my wife is indicating to me that I should shut up. I mean, you know, she does that all the time at home, so it's nothing new. But I got a sense from London that I can take my time. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know where to go, but my wife is indicating that she's the boss. So, you know, I'll sum up here that, you know, there is this, I, I'm, I'm troubled, I'm not comfortable because there are distinct and troubling evidence about polarization along religious community and social lines and this is particularly evident in North Indian states and I'm definitely not comfortable and let us see how, because the government of, of course makes statements that you know we are trying our best and you know there's a large country, 1.3 billion people, how can we avoid these kinds of incidents in every village or every Mufasil town? You know, well-meaning individuals do not change their strongly held views, even if these are not based on evidence. I will say that this book is an attempt to pierce through that armor of conviction, which is often without sound basis of facts and reasoning. And lastly, I'll conclude my remarks here. I, my book is dedicated to my parents who were and continue to be my inspiration even though they have passed away. My father, Bijoy Bhagwati, spent seven years of his youth, the height of his youth, in British jails and in installments during the freedom movement. And he founded a lasting movement for tea garden workers, which has provided them basic health, social security, and so on. And my mother, whom I revere, Bimal Bhagwati was a perfectionist who wrote so many books and she also received a Sahitya Academy Award. Thank you so much for listening to me and we will move on with the evening's program. CBI, CAG and CBC. <laughs> so tell us more about the three C's that you have introduced in your book. How did you use that as a way to measure or to you know, grade prime ministers? You hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, uh, let's take Nehru. He was the first prime minister, not for any other reason. The three C's are character, competence, and charisma. Character, is there any question about Nehru's character? I didn't need to say more than one line. Charisma, he won election after election. And in those days, they didn't have mobile phones, they didn't have WhatsApp. He had to actually travel first by train often to places which don't have air connections. There are not so many airfields, not even Air Force airfields. And uh, so charisma given again. Competence, I'm not so sure. Particularly when it comes to foreign policy, not so much. So that is how I've analyzed in the book, in the legacy section, so that the entire content of the chapter in some ways, in some ways is coming to uh, ahead at the end of the chapter where I use these three metrics, I think we can call them metrics, to explain how I felt their, I don't want to use the word performance because it sounds like uh, very presumptuous of me to be giving performance points to prime ministers, but all my life somebody senior to me was giving me points on, on my confidential reports and then later on, uh, you know, once the we were beyond the confidential reports, you know, whether you come to the notice of the minister or the prime minister determines what happens to you. So I, well, I, I must say that and I enjoyed, I, mu I must confess, I enjoyed giving some of these points to our 
prime ministers without ranking them 0 to 10, you know, 9 out of 10 or whatever. But yes, so I would say on competence, on foreign policy, he missed a several turns with regard to the United States. You, he was too prickly on the United States in terms of lecturing people, whether it was Nixon when he came to India or whether it was, I, uh, whether it was John uh, Kennedy when he visited the US. And uh, so yeah, so I, that's the way in which I have, at the end of each chapter, talked about the three C's and how I have sure. felt they could be, if for the lack of any other word, rated. No, I think one, one thing which really struck me, I mean, first of all, I think the construct of using the lens of prime ministers is, is a brilliant one, and it's a different way of looking at our history. But one thing that struck me is that you're even-handed in your book, in the sense, uh, uh, you know, you have both praised and where you felt that on some issues they were lacking. And so it is not ideological in that sense. You're moderate, balanced, middle of the road. And today in a world where everything seems polarized, how did you keep this balance in the way you did the book? Uh, thank you so much, Nandan, for asking that question. In fact, that goes to the heart of why I wrote the book. Because I found that many people who are as knowledgeable, perhaps more knowledgeable, far more gifted in, than me in writing, because as we discussed just before this program started, it is numbers that speak to me. Words, come diffi more diff is, uh, words are more difficult for me, and it's very difficult for me to write uh, a book, for instance. And I, I mean, forget a book, even an article. So yes, uh, I felt that, how do I put it, it doesn't sound condescending, or that books were written by people who are at times far more knowledgeable than them, but they're hedging their bets because they're looking for some job or looking for some political career or looking for something. If you're going to look for anything, then you cannot write an even-handed book. And my USP, I feel, I've been, I said it in the, in the prologue part of the chapter, I've got a little section of one paragraph, why did I write this book? And I say precisely this, that I want people to get an unadulterated version of what happened and the analysis. To some extent, I felt perhaps I could have reduced the narrative, but you know, you can't really analyze if you shrink the narrative too much. So the narrative followed by analysis and even-handed. If I made mistakes, readers will hopefully say honest mistakes. So you, you deliberately went out to write a balanced book because you felt the environment was... Not enough of that nature of books in, uh, in the market. Uh, so lots and lots of books by retired civil servants, former ministers, some serving ministers at times, some serving ministers have written books. But it's always with a view to push the interest of the political party they belong to. And I don't need to tell you how many civil servants have become governors and so on and so forth. And how many civil servants then become chief election commissioner or controller and auditor general and so on. I think there needs to be a, uh, a gap of some time. You can call it cooling off period or whatever. I think the people should demand that so that their writings become a little more objective. Because there's almost seems to be a one-to-one -one correlation between their views and, their, uh, and the kind of positions they get while in service and after service. I think it's to do with longevity. Now they reti retire at 60 and then you still have 30 more years. So then you need these jobs post-retirement. Well, uh, I think the government's pensions now are way, way better than what they used to be. Yeah, of course, if you have very expensive lifestyles, then that pension will not be enough. But it's more than the money. It's actually people get used to a certain lifestyle. You know, they press a bell and a peon comes. They pick up a phone and the PA says, yes, sir, what do you want? People get used to that. And that is both uh, civil service. I think it might happen even in the corporate world. But corporate world, you earn enough that you can hire all of these people to keep saying yes, sir, till <laughs> <laughs> you pass away. But for government people, they can't afford this. So then they have to, if you'll allow me to use the expression, suck up to some people in some way in their writing or in the way they speak at public platforms to be able to get that. So you're right, longevity is one thing, but you know, longevity, there are so many things you can do. You can write, you can read, you can walk, you can learn to play the piano, whatever. You don't have to try to get another job.
They say that the Right to Information Act was the biggest job creating act because it creates so many uh, information commissioners. So there's some at some point there's some 63 IAS officers who were information. So you think they were all job creation schemes or? Uh? Yes and no. Uh, first of all, uh, the no part of it, because I think the Right to Information Act is a, a very powerful act. And I think it's a huge positive step for our country where I remember a long time ago when I was an undersecretary, that's the junior most position in government, the joint secretary told me information is power. Don't just tell everybody everything you know. Keep it to yourself. When he comes asking for it, then you give it little by little. <laughs> and then you extract something in return. I mean, that's a standard thing in government. But as a young undersecretary, I didn't know this. So he had to explain it to me because I was trying to put too much in writing up to the minister. His thing was, just give the minister what he needs. Don't give him more. <laughs> you never know what he'll come back to you with. <laughs> but information for those who are not in government, I think you know, you're bewildered with the way government functions or does not function. And to that extent, you can send with a very low sum of money. You can ask for information. Now, the problem is this, that do we have the right kind of people who are information commissioners? If you've worked all your life in government, basically withholding information because information is power, <laughs> now you are asked to divulge information as information commissioner, that is a contradiction in terms. So their first, I mean, here I'm talking about the honest people within inverted commas. His whole life's training is keep everything to be. Now this chap is asking for information, you have to give it to him, so you don't want to give it to him. So you find ways of not giving it to him. <laughs> But then there is also this aspect that you are thinking after in information commissioner what? Five years you get as information commissioner, you get a type something bungalow in Moti, new Moti Bagh in Delhi. But this will also be over. So I better tailor my views, whether I'm an election commissioner or an information commissioner, to the views of the prevailing government. And what are their prospects that they'll come back? If it is very apparent, as it was apparent in Manmohan Singh's second term, he's not coming back. So I have a feeling the information commissioners are already anticipating how the next government will behave and who they need to now cater to. <laughs> so the problem here is that why don't we, as a country, and I'm asking all of you, those who are not in government, to demand this of government, that make the selection process of the information commissioners Wider. Why does it always have to be a retired IS officer? Why does a retired IS officer have to be an election commissioner? Election commissioner is not a, such a rocket science kind of job. He doesn't have to do open heart surgery. So why are we making the job of the chief vigilance commissioner, the all the three election commissioners, all the information commissioners, the controller and auditor general, all these are post-retirement jobs. I'm not saying that you exclude the IS or this service or that service. Why can't we have uh, an academic, somebody who's good with numbers for s something to do with the CAG's job? You've been an economist, you've worked in the private sector, now you are like an emeritus, you're 62 years or whatever you are. Why shouldn't government look for such people? And people with backbone who say it the way it is. I don't know, there's a kind of, I've always wondered, why is there not more public reaction to the fact that these so-called watchdogs, CBI director, why does it always have to be an IS officer, uh, IPS officer? And we know, we don't need the Supreme Court to tell us that it is a caged parrot and all these kinds of things. You have a CBI director being dismissed at 12 midnight, not 12 noon. <laughs> then you have one CBI director who his guard outside his house is recording how many of the people whose cases he's investigating are visiting him personally. <laughs> I mean, we don't need to... <laughs> so, you know, you need to yeah. throw this open yeah. to people like Nandan okay. and others. No, I've done my stint, so I'm not <laughs> going back. Uh, but tell me, as a foreign service guy who is in South Block, how did you get a job as Joint Secretary Capital Markets in the Ministry of Finance, which is a very prized job for an IAS guy? So how did you display the IAS guy and get that job? What is that, you know? Every now and then there is a black swan event. <laughs> <laughs> so for the IS, that was a black swan event. See, I had gone and done my uh, degrees. Uh, I'd done my master's in physics before joining the Foreign Service, but my, my qualifications in the area of finance, you know, government is quite liberal as long as you don't ask them for a specific posting. When I requested Mr. Peter Sinai, uh, who I believe is Bangalore-based, 
uh, I don't know whether he is Bangalore based or not. He was additional secretary administration. So I went to him. He's a big boss. He's the head of administration in MEA. And I requested him it's for the Carter Controlling Authority. No, that was his brother, who was in the Department of Personnel, who was an IS officer. He was foreign service. First of all, I have to get my foreign service bosses to agree. Then I have to get Mr. Lin Sinai, I think his name was, who was the establishment officer. Uh, so I went to him and said, sir, I want to go. for this. Here's my admission, and I need to go to study. So he looked at me as if I was crazy. He says, what? You want to study now? You've already done your master's. You've been in the foreign service for these many years. Oh, I understand what you want to do. You just want to go to the US. So I'm posting you to our embassy in Washington right away. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So I went and did my work. And as it turned out, uh, somebody who was teaching at MIT went to the World Bank. He left his job in academics and joined. And there he became friendly with somebody called Lester Siegel. And in their conversation, Lester Siegel was heading the derivatives group in the World Bank in those days. And there, Lester was telling him, I need a quant. So uh, this gentleman said, I know the right person for you. There is this fellow called Bhagwati. You get him. So I got a call, and they, he said, you come for an interview. And that's how it happened with regard to World Bank. So I built up a certain expertise. Then, as I said, Black Swan event. I was coming back to India. And uh, somebody in the prime minister's office felt that this fellow is better suited to the finance ministry rather than back in his parent ministry because he's now worked for almost eight years in the World Bank and the World Bank Treasury. So when somebody from the prime minister's office puts up papers to the prime minister, even the IS lobby could not <laughs> resist <laughs> that pressure, and I got that job. Okay. And you survived that job for? I will, let me, I did not mention in the book, but I will tell this group one little story. After one year, as Joint Secretary Capital Markets, I was getting rid of Badla. I don't know whether you, anybody here is familiar with this contango type uh, practice that we had in the Bombay Stock Exchange. And at that time, uh, the Bombay Stock Exchange uh, was still the kind of major stock exchange, national stock exchange had not completely overtaken it because as you know today, the bulk of the derivatives markets are managed by the national stock exchange, not by the BSE. So I was getting rid of contango slash badla, and we'll not get into the details of what all that is, but basically it's all nefarious stuff. So a bunch of 40 brokers went to uh, the prime minister. The prime minister didn't meet them, somebody else met them. So, and uh, the then finance minister, who shall remain unnamed, sort of sided with the brokers and said, yes, yes, yes get rid of this Bhagwati fellow, useless chap from the foreign service anyway. But somebody in the prime minister's office said, well, you can get rid of him, but then make him chairman Sebi. At which point of time, the broker said, no, 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 let him remain in Delhi. <laughs> We'd rather he's in Delhi than do more damage to us here in Mumbai. And uh, I was reading a book that uh, you were in Delhi when Indira Gandhi got assassinated. And you were assigned the job of part of the group for the funeral. Tell us more about that. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was... Uh, very disconcerting, should we say, unsettling time. Uh, Rita, our daughter Janavi, and I were in Tejpur, where I was born, and I was with my parents doing my home leave. Uh, I had come from Havana, Cuba, Fidel Castro's Cuba. We get home leave once in three years. So I'd, And then I saw early in the morning, somewhere around 10, 30, 11, my mother's younger brother approaching our house, and he came in, and he looked very agitated, and he said, do you know the news? Do you know the news? And I said, what is that? He said, Indira Gandhi has been assassinated. She's just been declared dead by BBC, not by All India Radio. BBC announced the news to the world rather than our own news agencies because they were worried, I suppose, you know, well, who will get angry with them. Anyway, the next day we flew into Delhi and uh, the taxi driver said, I'll charge you 350 rupees more to go from Palam, there was no Indira Gandhi airport at that time, to Defense Colony. and. I said, why? They said, but there are riots everywhere. Don't you understand? The Sikhs are being butchered. I said, but you're not a Sikh. I'm not a Sikh. He says, no, no, but suppose somebody throws a stone, you know, my car will be damaged. Anyway, to cut a long story short, while I was there, I got a call saying, you're not going back to Cuba right now. We need you for the uh, protocol room where you will be in the control room 
looking at who's coming and what arrangements have been made for their stay, etc. It's basically protocol or duty. But since they were short of hands, they said, whoever is in town, grab them. What worried me, and I've referred to that, is that one of my service colleagues, when I was expressing my anguish at what was happening and why is government not acting? Where is home ministry in all this? Where is the lieutenant governor? Where is the police commissioner? And if the taxi driver can see it, everybody can see it, how can you pretend that you don't know what is going on? And this, I was surprised, this is a foreign service colleague saying to me, well, the Sikhs had it coming. So I was so startled so that, you know, so there is something wrong with us as a people where we feel that random violence against Sikhs in East Delhi who have nothing to do with Indira Gandhi's assassin assassination. Their names are not Bayan Singh and Satwan Singh, the names of the two Sikhs who killed her, who were in her kind of personal security detail, means that killing of innocent Sikhs here, there, and the other, mainly in Delhi and in East Delhi, was justified. So, yes, so it was a very unsettling moment because I suddenly saw somebody whom I considered peer group and who would have roughly the same views. He might be helpless, but at least basic sympathy, the basic human feelings if they're not there. So sometimes I'm reminded nowadays about some things that happen in North India that, you know, some when I see senior officials trying to justify, I get that same kind of sound sanctimonious revulsion about what's going on around me. Yeah, just to switch, uh, let's go back to the finance role. Uh, you played a big part of the, uh, I think I'm, as part of the Vajpayee government, reforming the like new institutions. Can you talk about that? I think the IRDA, all that was set up at that time and uh, the pension reforms. Pension reforms in particular, but even more important, the introduction of derivatives. I'll speak first of derivatives. Uh, so you had to go get rid of Badla and the point that was being made by brokers in Mumbai, and they were correct. They're saying that this is our desi derivatives. And what is wrong with desi stuff? You people come from outside, you do masters in MIT and Tufts and whatever, work in World Bank, you don't know our Indian condition. The usual argument, you know. We know better than you because we are Indians, real Indians. You are just some fellows who have come from outside. So anyway, I managed to convince our minister, Yashwan Sinha, that derivatives needed to be in introduced. He was very skeptical at initially, but finally I convinced him it needed an amendment of the Securities Contract Regulation Act. I won't get into the details of the act and whatever I've written in the book about that, but I suddenly got a call the day this amendment had to be passed by the Lok Sabha. I got a call from the minister's office. You know, this is how people speak in Delhi. Saab yaad kar rahe. So, I, so I know Saab yaad kar rahe from his senior PPS means Yashwan Sinha, finance minister, needs me. I Saab ka hai? Saab Parliament House mein hai. Wo abhi wo discussion ho hai, wo yaad kar rahe. I said, I can't get in there and the, you want me to be there in five minutes. No, no, Saab ka ek gaadi hai niche. So I get into Saab's gaadi and go to Parliament House and Yashwan Sinha is actually waiting for me. The minister is waiting for me. So I said, come, come, come. He said, I said, explain what is derivatives. <laughs> so I, I said, all this Nikki, Lisa, and you know, Bering Brothers all collapsed because of derivatives and now you want to introduce derivatives in India. You're going to sort of create a lot of problems for me. So I kind of rolled up my sleeves, figuratively speaking, and started explaining derivatives. I said, wow, I have a chance now to tell this cabinet minister what are derivatives. <laughs> After about five, seven minutes, he put up his right hand like that. I said, you know, I've just started. I have to, so much more I have to tell you. He said, what's wrong with you? Now I know more than every member in the parliament. I don't need to know as much about derivatives as you. <laughs> I need to know more than them. Just carry on with your work. You've done your bit. <laughs> so that's how derivatives got introduced. So it got passed. The amendment got passed. The amendment got passed with thumping <laughs> of table because he went into he kept the minister kept notes as I was talking. Uh, By the time he was over repeating whatever he had so noted, how did he sell it to Parliament. He sold it as a risk mitigation tool. Oh, okay. So you are re reducing risk, and he explained how it can be reduced because it's being done through an exchange where there are margin payments. So if a party defaults because they don't have money, the stock exchange already has enough in its kitty to be able to do make good to the other side of the transaction. That's why it's better than Badla. That's why it's way better than Badla and uh, way better 
than an over-the-counter derivative. I, I will get started <laughs> into <laughs> areas no, no, with people. But, but I think that thing that you launched today, it's a very big part of the Indian market, right? Absolutely. It's a very big part of the market. And the National Stock Exchange, you have to give them full marks for it. They immediately picked up that this is a market which will take off. Mm. And they set themselves up technically. This is kind of getting a little bit of an echo. Maybe I'm holding it too close. Uh, they set themselves up technically and otherwise to be able to take advantage of a growing market, of which I don't need to tell you. When you can see a market will grow like this s at a 45, even 60 degree angle to the horizontal axis, that's where you jump on to that train. And they did, and they did very well. We'll not get into rolling settlements and uh, all that. The other thing, let's talk about pension reform. I think. Yes. The biggest reform which people have not noticed is moving from defined benefits to defined contribution from January 1st, 04. In, so just tell, talk about that. I, it probably happened after you left, but you began the process. I began the process, and it happened in the following way. Uh, Dr. E. A. S. Sarma, someone I respect enormously. I think he's now retired in Vijayakapatnam. He was my immediate boss. I think you met him yeah, uh, more than one occasion. Uh, I know you know. Time. OK, a fabulous human being and a fabulous officer. So uh, we were at a meeting with the minister. And the minister said, you know, you joint secretaries, you don't give me any new ideas. You just keep repeating whatever you're doing. Give me new ideas. And what are we doing in the finance ministry? He just said it off the cuff. I mean, because the minister also has to say something. So he berated us as, you know, you fellows are just repeating things. You are babus. He was himself a babu sometime back, but anyway. So I put up my hand. And yes, Sarma is looking at me apprehensively because he, as a tried and tested person, officer, knows that when the minister is saying these things, you're not supposed to say anything. You're supposed to have your tea and your biscuits and go. <laughs> but I was on the Foreign Service, not from the IS Biradri. Didn't know that I have to keep quiet at this time. Wait, I have you guys talk, up, talk back, is it? Well, I was guys don't know when they should uh, not talk in the finance ministry. <laughs> in their own ministry, they know. <laughs> in the finance ministry, I made the mistake of putting up my hand and saying, sir, we are doing things we should not do, and we are not doing things we should do. So he said, what? <laughs> so I t he said, give me an example of what we are not doing. Not get into all the details. I said, pension, why is EPFO running and EPFO reports to Ministry of Labor? It's all to do with the government's finances. Why is the finance ministry not in charge of this issue? So this is just an empire building grab. Partly that. Because I knew that it will uh, sound good to the minister. <laughs> He's going to take away something from the Ministry of Labor. But I was genuinely concerned that our defined benefits could make life very difficult for government and periods of fiscal and other stress. So the next morning, I get a call from E.S. Sarma. So he says, no good deed goes unpunished. You made up your mind to talk in front of minister. Now, from tomorrow, not only are you Joint Secretary Capital Markets and External Commercial Borrowings, you're also Joint Secretary Pension Reforms. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how the whole thing started. So we put up some numbers based on some empirical work and some number crunching. And as you rightly said, gradually, government accepted. And I must give uh, credit to Dr. E.S. Sarma's successor, Ajit Kumar. Ajit Kumar called me in and said, I don't understand any of all this. He looks at me and I. Tell me honestly, this is a good thing or not. I said, sir, honestly speaking, it's a good thing. OK, I signed. <laughs> <laughs> That's how sometimes things happen in government. That's great. And uh, uh, I'll ask one last question, and then we'll open it up. Uh, but you know, you talk about this time when you were ambassador at Brussels. And this was just after the global financial crisis. And uh, I think Dr. Manmohan Singh was there. And f he turned to you and said, why don't you give me a note on the global financial crisis? So did all the other chaps feel, why is he asking this IFS ambassador to, on this? They were very irritated, I'm quite yeah. sure. I'm quite sure everybody was very irritated, including one secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs. So I get a call while I'm in the entourage of the Prime Minister in Marseille, because the Prime Minister was coming in from New York, and we were going to have an India-France summit and an India-EU summit. And France, as the then president of the EU, Sarkozy, a tremendously e egotistical gentleman, was the president of the EU. And uh, the prime minister was told, as he was descending from the aircraft by Ranjan Mathai, who was the ambassador, that Nicolas Sarkozy wants to talk to you about the capital markets fiasco, imbroglio, the global financial crisis. 
That's right, because this was 30th of September, 2008. 15th of September, 2008, Lehman Brothers had gone belly up. So we are talking just 15 days after that, and Nicolas Sarkozy is saying, here I've got an economist prime minister coming to see me. Forget India, EU, forget India, France. I want to understand what the hell is going on, and maybe our French banks are also going to collapse. <laughs> So the ambassador very seriously tells Prime Minister, sir, you know, all those meetings are okay, but we have made time for you to meet with the French president separately. He wants only one-on-one. -on -one. Uh -huh. No aids, nothing, he just wants to talk to you. So the Prime Minister looks at Ranjan and says, I know nothing about capital markets. I think Germany can meet him. <laughs> so I think he'll be able to explain things better. So Ranjan Bathai, you know, his face was ashen. He says, he didn't know whether the Prime Minister is joking or is he serious because the French would have kind of belted him as the ambassador. You don't understand protocol? Who is this fellow? Some idiot fellow from the Foreign Service. He can't be talking one-on-one -on -one with our Prime Minister. The Prime Minister was obvious, obviously joking. So by the time he reached his hotel, he told uh, me via somebody, because you know the Prime Minister travels on this car key. He's, his car is preceded by the protocol cars, and then we lowly people come further down. And I got a call on my mobile saying that immediately on reaching, rush to Prime Minister's suite. So I go there, there is, we'll not mention the names, everybody, if you know 30th of September, who was NSA, who was Foreign Secretary, who was Secretary West, you can easily find out. Uh, so they were all in the room, and uh, the Prime Minister turns to me and says, I want a note from you in one hour on this global financial, one hour, he wants a note from you on the global financial crisis. What does it uh, mean for France? What does it mean for India? What does it mean for I Asia? So one secretary is spluttered, sir, but we got comments from RBI, we've got comments from Ministry of Finance, it's all that, let me show you, sir, this is uh, sort of flag A, flag B. Prime Minister looked coldly at him. Dr. Manmohan Singh is a very gentle person when he talks to people, he looked quite coldly at this secretary and said, Germany, please carry on, we'll <laughs> <laughs> I, I need that note. So yeah, so yes, he, he uh, was that kind of a person who respected expertise, and he felt that right now, over here in France, this is the only fellow who knows this stuff, so let him give me a note, and let me then talk knowledgeably to Sarkozy. So he didn't pretend, he's a macroeconomist, he's a trade economist, that's his PhD under IMD Little. Uh, so he didn't pretend that he's an expert on, oh, most of the stuff was because of derivatives, and AIG and so on, because of credit default swaps, but I'll stop there, because I think I'll Thank you, I, I think that's great. I think. Uh, that is fabulous. I think, why don't you just do a book on anecdotes? <laughs> don't talk about prime ministers and all that. Just tell us anecdotes. <laughs> so I think the anecdote, anecdote is actually more fun. So perhaps we can uh, open it up for uh, questions. Uh, Ravi, will you handle the mic business? Uh, good evening. James Bronner here. Uh, uh, for the period covered in your book, um, how would you describe or characterize the reciprocal influence of the foreign policy and the economic policy? Where are you? I can't see right you. Here. Ah, right here. Okay, there you are. Okay. Right. Sorry, can you just repeat that? I was looking for my glasses. To yeah, from your, your unique perspective, how, how would you characterize the, over the time period uh, covered in your book, the reciprocal impact or influence of uh, Indian foreign policy and economic policy? Let's begin with Nehru. Because it's so far away that most of the time it's easy to say about that period without getting people to chase you with, a, with, with some dangerous instrument. So, uh, Nehru, there was immense and tremendous opportunities lost, I feel, because of some aspects of foreign policy which had a bearing on economic policy. What do I mean by that? The U.S. was looking for India to support its efforts to contain communism. I'm deliberately dumbing it down a bit because, you know, there are so many strands. Uh, so. The Nehru was not going to be part of U.S. plans to contain communism. For him, decolonization was important. For him, the past record of what many Western nations, either colonizing parts of the world that they were far away from, was something he felt that needed to be reversed. And he talked about India's solidarity with China, with Southeast Asia, and so on and so forth. The U.S. was looking for India to join CENTO, Seattle, et cetera. Now, yes, it would have been a tremendous error to join any of these military pacts, but perhaps Nehru could have not lectured his American counterparts on what he felt was the right approach to take during the Korean War or any of those major trouble spots around the globe. To that extent, he lost out on 
forging closer links with what was at that point of time, now it is not as large, 35% of global GDP. So to that extent, he lost out on forging relationships, promoting relationships between Indian private sector and the US private sector. It's also a question of his temperament. Uh, and on one occasion, on one visit to the US, including a visit to New York, he was in a room with about, whatever, 50, 60 very rich top CEOs of the US. And uh, one of those CEOs got up and said, uh, in those days, a billion dollars was a lot of money. We're talking about the 50s. And uh, he said, sir, do you realize that you, know, you are in a room uh, of 50 billionaires? And uh, if you look at Maharaj Rasgotra's uh, autobiography, he was personally present in the room. Maharaj Rasgotra, by the way, just in case you don't know, was a foreign secretary uh, at one point of time in the Ministry of External Affairs was High Commissioner to London and so on. Uh, but he says that Nehru was aghast at this, what he thought was a very, very insensitive and crass remark, saying, you know, we are very rich people and you better understand as the Indian Prime Minister. That so he had to divorce. I felt he did not sufficiently divorce his personal uh, dislike for uh, the West, which continued to apologize for racist policies in South Africa or colonial policies which uh, they would fudge and try to delay matters at the UN. So to that extent, yes, I think we lost out both on technology as well as economic linkages with the West because of Nehru's point of view, which was that you know these countries are not sufficiently sensitive about newly independent countries. They want to again enmesh these countries in military linkages and some other linkages which again subordinate or somehow detract from our full political independence. Uh, my name is Kishore Rao. Uh, very basic question, Mr. Bhagwati. Sorry to come down from those lofty heights to, you talked about the average person and you also talked about average people being heard, uh, an oxymoron, I mean, how, how does an ordinary person get heard, an average person out in the streets? How do you get heard now? Heard, you said? Heard. Unfortunately, at the moment, uh, the primary way in which they are getting heard is through the ballot box. And I think that's not uh, enough. Uh, because that happens once in five years, whether it is for the state assembly. Of course, if you if the state assembly is dissolved or there's no majority, you might have more frequent elections. Unfortunately, and I emphasize this, uh, uh, that it is too infrequent that they are only being heard through the ballot box. I think we in civil society need to give them other forums. It's happening in some ways, whether it is through NGOs, whether it is to people who are voicing their point of view through newspaper editorials or magazine articles or research pieces. But we need to also think in terms of the vernacular here because some of those articles, and I think the majority of those pieces are in uh, state capitals written in English. So we need to be able to spread out more to reach those average people who don't live anywhere near a state capital, who don't speak anything but a variant of the local state language, maybe not even uh, the state language, but they speak perhaps a dialect which even people uh, in the state capitals do not fully understand. So you're right, it is very difficult. You need social activists, you need, ultimately you really need politicians who care. But you know, that seems like a contradiction in terms sometimes in India. Uh, my name is Vivek Bami. I want to ask you about socialism since you made a brief mention of it. I'm here. Ah, there you are, yeah. okay. Um, in fact, uh, if you look around the world today, one of the most successful economies in the world, in fact, is socialist, which is China. Especially it calls itself socialism with Chinese characteristics. And my understanding is that right from Nehru to Modi, India is also socialist in its economic policies with a few uh, tweaks, as you said, when Narasimha Rao came in to make it a little more capitalist. Uh, so why 
why is socialism a bad word? Why is it uh, so looked down upon when in fact, in reality, we are a socialist country? And why don't we follow an example which is very successful in blending its own characteristics with its, uh, with its uh, brand of socialism? Why can't we have socialism with Indian characteristics? We can and we should. I don't believe there's anything wrong with socialism. Uh, all I would submit is that we don't want socialism which turns into the Chinese variety where there is just one party. Because I really feel that we need to have a multiplicity of parties and multiplicity of voices. Because you know, once you have one party, China has been able to do it for a variety of reasons, good for them, they are happy where they are. We need to not go back on our constitution and uh, find uh, that we prefer a one party system. But having said that, I completely agree with you, socialism with a human face, socialism with uh, which does not uh, take away from a human being's desire to excel. Because sometimes what happens, because you had socialism, or you can use another word, communism in Russia, or the Soviet Union as it was called, they did not succeed economically anywhere near what China has. So to some extent, I think uh, sometimes we overdo the political aspects of socialism and communism. You can take some of the better aspects of that, but yet have a multi-party system. And I'll stop there because I'm now talking in generalities. And I don't see any reason why these two things need to be uh, in competition with each other or contradict or are mutually exclusive, which is, means that you have certain social safety nets. Uh, I've lived in Belgium and I found that they had fantastic social safety nets and yet they had private sector. So we can have a caring society which builds safety nets for people who are old, people who cannot work, people, what I have various uh, uh, kinds of help that the state can support. But for that, you need to have economic growth at a level which provides the taxes to, for the government to be able to provide those services and benefits. Actually, I want to ask you, you, you spent time in Havana mm -hmm. when Fidel Castro was there. So tell us your experience of that. I will begin with an anecdote. Because yeah. you told Anec me anecdotes is what you like. Yeah, <laughs> anecdote only I want. So anecdotes is Regla was one of our two maids. The other maid was Sisa. Because of the fact that it's a communist country with very low salaries in pesos convertibles. That is, means a convertible peso, which was $1.1 in Fidel Castro. I mean, if you go to the black market, 25 Cuban pesos equal to one US dollar. But since I'm, we as diplomats have to go through the banking channels, 1.1 pesos, pardon me, dollars is equal to one. So we could get maids who were very, uh, should we say, well-read in many ways, and the children were doing very well. So one of the days I was just chatting with Regla, one of the two maids, and I said, Regla, what about your children? Who are they, where are they? She said, I have one son and one daughter. So I said, okay, what do they do? She says, one is an engineer, one is a doctor. And then I said, uh, how did that happen? Because you know, I can make out that she's not from an income bracket, because I'm thinking with my same Indian mind. How did you become engineer, doctor, one generation? You are made, and the next generation is doctor and engineer. And she went into fulsome praise for Fidel Castro and his regime. She says that my children were bright, they worked hard, I encouraged them to work hard, and uh, they got scholarships right through. So they didn't have to pay a penny. Their school books are taken care of. Their school uniforms are taken care of. So that is one aspect. So when you are at that income bracket, socialism, communism, whatever you want to call it, can help uh, those who are gifted and who work hard. But there was the other aspect of uh, socialism. Luis was a driver in the embassy. So Luis was a short, fat chap. And I asked Luis one day, what are you doing here in the embassy? Uh, where were you before? So he says, I was working as a driver in uh, some state-owned company. And one day I made a mistake. My truck was uh, too tall to go through this tunnel, which said that no vehicles above 10 feet or whatever. You must have seen it around the world, where it says, you know, kindly do not try to. So he, in his hurry, decided to go through and got stuck. So then, of course, he ran away ab abandoning the truck, but Cuba is an island, <laughs> it's a small place, it's a communist country. They found him in no time, put him in jail for several years. So that is the other aspect of communism, that if you make a mistake, you pay very, very dearly. I think the crime was not such that he should have to go to jail for several years. 
I mean, they can give him a penalty. They can take some money off his salary to pay for the repairs of the truck or whatever. So I got a sense that if you can have, you know, some of the good things of what Cuba has to offer without, and then you had neighborhood watch uh, groups. So every neighborhood, they didn't watch us. I mean, they had their intelligence watching us, but you know, they're not that interested in us. But every area in Havana, of course, I traveled all over the country. My predecessors all got out of the Havana posting. They said, who will go to this? We have in the Foreign Service A star, A, B, C, C star. A star, by definition, is New York and you know things of the Washington, D.C., and then so on and so forth. Havana in those days was C star. So my two of the people who were posted there got out of it. They said, my God, I've got health problems, this, that, and the other. But I told my boss, Manishankar Ayer, he said, I, I think I'll use the expression he used, you're all aware of Manishankar Ayer. He was my immediate boss. He said, you know, Secretary K.S. Bajpai has got the hots for you. So he's going as ambassador to Washington. Why don't you ask him? You'll get posted there. I said, no, I want to understand how a communist system works. I never chose Russian as my CFL, compulsory for foreign language. So I've not been to Moscow or to any East European country. I believe they have great music also in Cuba. I'll go to see star posting. So there I was, so I got a sense that, you know, Fidel could connect with people. That's why he used to give these six hour long speeches. And I, like an idiot, was forced to summarize them and send them to the ministry, which are lying there. Nobody's ever bothered to read about Fidel Castro, what wisdom he spouted over six hours. And he would speak in Spanish, I speak Spanish. So I would sort of, you know, make short <laughs> summaries of his six hour speeches. But I got a sense that he can connect with people, so he can get things done. But he was wasting his time getting them to produce 10 million tons of sugar. See, this is the problem. The economic thinking, I mean, thinking on economic policy gets warped because he's got this thing that, you know, if Cuba can produce 10 million, you've got 10 million people. If you produce so much sugar, the international prices of sugar, you know, you can get the same amount of money with 9 million tons as you can with 10, depending on the price. So. I found that the economic decision making was quite divorced from reality, but yet they were a fun loving people. And those of you who have heard the music of Buena Vista uh, Club, I mean, these are uh, people, old Cubans who went and did this disc for some New York person. Uh, fantastic music, fantastic dances. So that the social, and the family values and the family uh, connections were similar to us in India, very close. Uh, but you had this overweening state control and straight checking on everything you are doing. But at yet at the same time, you have some people doing well because of state support. So I think net-net, not for us, but good for Cuba, but it's time for them to change, high time for them to change. Anybody else? Yeah, Lata. No, we, okay, but we have to give a fellow foreign service officer a chance. You uh, spoke about the revulsion you felt uh, at the time of Mrs. Gandhi's assassination. Now, uh, looking at what's happening today, and you see the same reaction from your peer group, how do you deal with that revulsion, especially when uh, you know somebody like me uh, feels scared to express uh, my point of view I don't know why, I mean, you know, people have taken much more risks, so we have to speak up. I'm speaking up right now. I mean, revulsion about someone being killed for no fault of theirs and seeking redressal from the government, I don't see why any of us should panic to write about it or read about it or speak about it. That's all I can say. Yes, there is an outside chance that something might happen to you, but hopefully there are more people who think like you and are not speaking up who also start speaking up. That's all I can say. Yeah, Lata. Uh, I was very interested to hear the story of how you went to the finance ministry, uh, Jaimini, and uh, I went to the commerce ministry at a much lower and much more junior phase as an undersecretary, and I loved working outside of NEA. But as you know, there's a big problem with normally getting foreign service officers to move to what would be seen as very prize postings by the IAS. I always had a problem when I was in charge of admin of finding volunteers and ended up having to twist a few arms to get people even to go to defense ministry, commerce ministry, 
or finance, we didn't have a regular post, but defense and commerce, which are two very prized ministries. Why do you think that is? Why do you think foreign service officers resist this idea of cross-pollination uh, so strongly and would rather be in the foreign service some, environment? Some uh, colleagues have told me, out of sight, out of mind. Next time I am need uh, appointment, depending upon how senior I am as ambassador or uh, some other position, it would be difficult to get such a position unless I am visible to my secretaries and the foreign secretary and the foreign minister and so on. I think that is to some extent true. So but that's to some extent that is the fault of the bosses and the ministry. I think the ministry should more actively encourage and if possible, uh, get certain slots at different levels allocated. Sudhakar is here, I'm sure his, as they say in Delhi, Biradri might object to it, but, uh, but Sudhakar will not. And there are always many Sudhakars in the IIS. So you can convince them that reciprocity, we don't want to give up anything in the foreign office. If you give some of them, as you know, the minister uh, commerce in Washington, sometimes at the level of director, sometimes at the level of minister, is from the IS. So give them some more positions. Economic economic economic. Minister economic, pardon yeah. me. Uh, the minister of commerce is the foreign service officer. You can give the minister of commerce also. Take a position as joint secretary. In the you do a trade, you're saying. Yes, so if you are prepared to give up some foreign allowance for getting what the IS says is measly allowances in Delhi, then you'll be able to convince them because you need to convince uh, the, the steel frame. Uh, again, Sudhakar, I don't know whether he agrees that it is still steely or has become a little bit like aluminum, I don't know. But uh, the, uh, the thing is, if it is not so much uh, the minister, if Pranam Mukherjee is finance minister, he doesn't really worry if it's a foreign service officer or a non-foreign service officer. It is the establishment officer and so on who have problems because for Joint Secretary and above in all other ministries except foreign office, this is what is known as an ACC appointment. So I won't bother the people here. But I mean, it's just a little more difficult to become a Joint Secretary in some other central government ministries as compared to the external affairs where we sort of in, you know, within the system we keep getting promoted. So I think that is the problem. If it's a little easier and they can be given some trade off, I mean some, some other jobs within the foreign office, then they might come, particularly outside. I don't think they're really interested in territorial divisions. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to ask yeah. a question. Nirupama. Yeah. Um, the, uh, one of the other reasons Germany also is, and Prince Lata and I both handled administration for a long time, many of our foreign service officers don't want to get stuck in tenure postings. You know, if you go to defense ministry or commerce mi finance ministry, you have to spend a stipulated period there. And that kind of cuts into the time that you get uh, in terms of a posting abroad, or you have that freedom in the ministry to spend, external affairs ministry to spend one or two years and then go abroad. I think there was a certain constraint placed on our officers, but that's not my question. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate you on the book and let me also say you do the Foreign Service proud. And uh, I would like to uh, raise uh, a point that I came across in an article that I read recently about being exquisitely sensitive to the ethics of memory. And I think that is a conundrum that we face today in India when it comes to looking at our past history, not in terms of centuries past, but post-independence history, and the role of prime ministers like Nehru. It comes into play very much in the sphere of foreign policy and decisions, critical decisions, affecting national security and the future of the country, like Kashmir, or you know, not being uh, willing uh, to take up an offer of a seat in the Security Council, purely apocryphal. But you know, the public mind and the public space is populated with so many such myths and stereotypes and prejudices, and therefore the ethics of memory becomes very compromised. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, I would agree with that. And uh, right now we are seeing what I think is some, and maybe I'm overstating it, when I see some of the WhatsApp messages I get, uh, there is a motivated attempt to rewrite history, to provide facts which have no correlation <laughs> or basis in fact. So uh, 
I think ethics is perhaps too high a standard for some of these people who want to say things and assert things which make absolutely no sense. Uh, to say that, you know, if I may, on Kashmir, since we Please. I referred to it, to the, uh, there are these assertions made that Nehru had done this and Nehru took the thing to the UN and he could have done this. No, we were not really independent in the sense that we know independence today on the 15th of August 1947. I want to say this very categorically. Our defense forces were headed by Britishers. Our uh, defense equipment, and I list for the benefit of readers in my book, every piece of equipment, almost 90% was of British origin by definition. The British Indian Army used British equipment. And uh, you won't get spares if you, you have a situation where your Independence of India Act makes it necessary for a Britisher to be appointed Governor General. And uh, Jinnah refused to do it, but there is a cost to it. The sterling balances of undivided India were held in the Bank of England. You could argue that you know they'll have to give us their, our share, etc. You know, in finance, you know, there's so many ways to divide and to say, well, you know, the sterling balances are actually not four sterling, but only 3.2 sterling, so you will only get two instead of three, and so on and so forth. They had us by the short hair in so many different ways that now, so many years later, to say that Nehru had full freedom of action, and he could have told Mountbatten when he is suggesting that we take the issue to the Security Council, that we had full freedom of action, he could have just said no. You say no there, but you'll have to give somewhere else. The very fact that those leaders were able to put together this country which is geographically contiguous, as we know, one other country was not geographically contiguous, and one part of it, to our east is a separate country. But why don't we take some of this into account when we look at that period? I've tried to explain it. People will say, oh, no, no, you are partisan. You are a great uh, 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 admirer of Nehru. I'm an admirer of Nehru, but based on facts, not based on some. I have uh, pointed out that on certain aspects of foreign policy, including the 62 war, including the appointment of Krishna Menon, who was one of my predecessors. In fact, the first high commissioner in London was a tremendous mistake. But your basic point, and I love this expression, ethics of memory. Uh, so that, I think, uh, is expecting too much of some people. So we others who believe, or at least would like to believe in the ethics, uh, should determine how we, we repeat some things of what has happened in the past. We'll use ethics as the, as the yardstick or the benchmark to say it the way it is to the best of our knowledge. It's a different matter if we go wrong because some fact we thought was a fact is not really a fact. Okay, last question and then we'll wrap up. Uh, this goes back to your father. Tell them how your father played a role in Assam being a part of India. Thank you, uh, Nandan. Uh, as somebody who is a great admirer of my father, uh, my mother said it once that in all the years of their marriage, she, she never heard him once raise his voice or get angry. I mean, I don't know how such people exist. I mean, I'm raising my voice every day about something or the other. Some people have the ability to control their emotions. This is 1946, November, December. Now, uh, the month is escaping me. Gandhi is in Noakhali trying to... Uh, calm the communal tensions between the Hindus and the Muslims and in what is today Bangladesh and Noakhali. In Guwahati, the then Prime Minister of Assam, as you all know, in those days chief ministers were called premiers and we had a premier called Gopinath Bordoloi. My father was known to Gandhi because Gandhi had come to Tejpur, the city I was born in. City, I think we should call it a little town. But, uh, and Gopinath Bordoloi was worried that in his exchange of letters, in those days it was all letters and at the most telegrams with Nehru, he was getting a sense that he was losing the argument for Assam to be part of India in the arguments that Nehru was having with Jinnah. Jinnah was saying, you know, Assam, uh, it's not a majority Muslim, but it has a much higher percentage of Muslims than the rest of India. And to that extent, Assam should naturally be part of East Pakistan. 
and not part, as you know, Curzon had you know, included Assam in East Bengal when he partitioned Bengal, but we won't go there. So Curzon had the same logic, that there are, uh, it's a higher percentage of Muslims. But the people of Assam said, we want to be part of India. We don't want to have a religious identity in the sense that you know, we are Muslims or we are Hindus and therefore we are part of this country or that. So Gopinath Bordoloi told my father, you better go and talk to Gandhi. The only man who can convince Nehru is Gandhi. And I can see that he's slipping and he is getting tired and he might just give up on Assam. And we in Assam want to be part of India. Can you imagine I would have been part of the, I don't know, Bangladesh Foreign Office or whatever. <laughs> so I'd have been a disaster. But anyway, so there, you, uh, Mr. <laughs> Uh, the then premier of Assam told my father, he says, you know, at that time you have to take a train, then you have to take a bus, and then you have to walk. So he says, one more person should go with you, you should not go alone. So he asked Mahindra Mohan Chaudhary, who much later became chief minister of Assam. So the two of them went off. They finally found Gandhi in some small village somewhere, and they sat down with him and tried to convince him. And so Gandhi, it seems, my father has never told us about the story. Can you imagine this strange man? Never tells us the real interesting stories. I read about it and came to know about it from Sanjay Hazarika's book. Um, someone who used to work in New York Times and has written a lot. Uh, and Nirod Borua's book, these two books. And of course, later on, one checked with him. So he was asked by Gandhi, and Gandhi was looking into his eyes and saying, is this just the view of the two of you and the premier of Assam, or is this the view of the people of Assam? So he said, no, this is by overwhelming majority of the people of Assam want to be part of India, not part of what will become East Pakistan. He says, okay, then you issue a press note, because in those days, by the time Gandhi manages to speak on the phone or whatever it is to Delhi, it'll take too long. He says, you immediately put it out in the press that you've discussed it with me, and I feel that the uh, wishes of the people of Assam should be respected. And I'm told, and I think there is some record of this in the Teen Murthy Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, that Nehru uh, waved that press coverage in front of Jinnah, and Jinnah sort of, you know, I'm, I'm now making this up. He did this and said, okay, you can keep us up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired and tired and awaiting for Gandhi to come back. God knows when he'll come back from Noah Kali. God knows what he will tell us. You keep us up. So by that slender thread of chance, then I am proudly an Indian. <laughs> well, I think... Uh, <laughs> With that, I think, uh, end a great session. Thank you, Jaimini. Wonderful. And uh, thank you all for listening so patiently.